For fuck's sake, for fuck's sake, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do. For fuck's sake, for fuck's sake, the world's gone mad and I'm sharing it with you. For fuck's sake, for fuck's sake, so sit right down, grab a glass of wine, maybe a cup of tea and some chocolates and, and join me for another. For fuck's sake. Welcome to FFS, exclamation mark. What could possibly be the theme? It's a bit chilly. I've got a saw on my head. There is an enormous tarantula-like creature lurching over my head. There's also a skeleton shimming up a drain pipe. What could it mean? Yes, it is Halloween today. And where better to join you from than here in the French Quarter in New Orleans, where they really do know a little bit of a thing about creepiness, let's be honest. Now, there was the first parade in 18 months. It rolled a few days ago. Crew de Boo last Saturday. I'm going to share some highlights from that, some wacky people, some wonderful costumes, and a sense of what it feels like to be almost normal again. It's the doctor and me. Look at that. He's come here to help me with my slight accident that I had earlier. Oh. It's not often that you come across an actual <laughs> land shark, you know, in the middle of the French Quarter. Yeah, yeah. But here he is, in all his beauty. I am with an actual land shark. Daddy shark to you, <laughs> that is, my dear. I'm going to give you How a you? Uh, a fin bump. So oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Oh. That's a fantastic outfit. What a beauty! Oh, thank you. Isn't he beautiful? Yeah. Oh, missing my dog. Ah. That's it. Don't worry. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's so good. I just love the commitment of people when they dress up. It's so fucking great. I, we haven't seen it for so long. So, oh, that is great. Blood. Of course, people are already absolutely shit-faced already, by the way. I think it's, what, 6.45 or something, and I think... More, more. Oh, this is good. I swear, I mean, it's less frightening in the daytime, but last night I almost pooped my pants. And isn't it ironic that, that, that I just kicked a hand grenade? Oh, Lord God. Isn't it interesting that I did that show about clowns and how utterly offensive and terrifying it? It's amazing I can stand this close. Anyway, it hasn't just been Halloween for me, you see, this last week here in New Orleans. I've been back in the studio in Esplanade with my fabulous collaborator, Mr. John Fishback. Yes, he of all my albums. And let's be honest, the man that recorded pretty much one of my favorite albums of all time, Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life. And I thought it was only right because there's enough horror in the world. You don't need this. I thought we needed some cheering up and some good conversation with John because he's such an incredible person. So I sat down with him yesterday in his home and spoke about his life, his career, Stevie. Uh, of course, it went on way, way, way longer. But let's just have, I think, a quick chat with this marvelous man and then we'll get back to horror drilling. Wasn't that thrilling watching me hanging out with terrifying clowns in the French Quarter? Here I am in New Orleans today. I am joined by a most fabulous man. He has been my co-producer and producer of my music and so many albums. You all know him because I've told you about him so many times. This is Mr. John Fishback. 
and we are seated before I let you speak. Isn't that, you know, it's, nothing's changed, of course. Look at this. If you're not, if this isn't Halloween, this, I mean, it's not, obviously. It's just an incredible canvas hippo. I love this piece. Anyway, I'm trying to tie it all together, but welcome, John Fishback, to Thank your you own me. house. To my own house. Yeah, to your house. own house. Thank you for having me and Matt Midlin here. There we are. Um, you and I have a theory as to why. I've been running around the French Quarter and I've been running around uptown, the Garden District, trying to find what would normally be spiders and coffins and skeletons and houses covered in webs. There's nothing, John. No. Because? I have a theory. I have a theory because you remember last year there was uh, no Mardi Gras really. So people said, yes, there will be. And everybody decorated as a house float. And they decorated their houses to look like floats that go in parades. And some very, very intricate. Yeah. This year, we have Halloween, which is normally nuts. I mean, it, the decorations are yeah. nuts. So my theory is that this year it's COVID related. And I think people are so tired of it, they don't want people that they don't know coming to their door all night. Trick-or-treating. Trick-or-treating. Trick yeah, so there are a few houses that have signs, they're safe houses uh, for kids. And there's just not a lot. There are? There are safe houses for kids? Yeah, and they're decorated like for Halloween. Really and far away from the Catholic ship. No. It, yeah, I know. There's safe houses for kids and they can come in and just get their yeah. yeah, and those people are willing to get COVID. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, don't hate me. I do actually hide. I turn the lights off. Yeah. I don't care where I am. If I hear ding, ding, ding. sorry Matt, you've got children. You have children. I'm just like, turn the lights off. And if the dogs start barking, I'm beside myself. I hope they'll just scare them away. This is an awful thing to admit to. But this year, I think that's... No, what, every year I'm like that. Up. I'm like that every yeah. year. I'm at... But for our neighborhood, it's, uh, it's really unusual because we see some great houses on this street. Yeah. You'll see some skeletons climbing yeah. a fence. But because it's a lot of kids on my street. Yeah, well, this is a, this is a family neighborhood. This yes. is an amazing place. But... Other than that, so yeah. uh, the point is, here we are. You're not originally from here. You are a New Yorker, if I may I call you that. I was born in New York. I left when I was uh, 18. Wow. And I went to, to Colorado, and then I went to Los Angeles, and then I went to Berkeley. And then... Uh, you came here? Eventually, I came here. My wife and I thought, we'll go to New Orleans, check it out. And if we like it, we'll stay. If we don't, we'll go right back to our house in L.A. And uh, six months later, we sold the house in L.A. And we've been here ever since. You're the reason I'm here. This is what's so fascinating, is that John Fishback is the reason I'm here. Not just because, um, because you wanted to sell us your condo. Because I bought this. <laughs> <laughs> I needed so they to sell trying, that. They were trying to unload it on yes. us but thank you but um also because well, i didn't actually know you, anything about you for the first couple of years except i liked you very much you and lynn i just I thought you were so marvelous and loved, loved your company but I, I but i didn't know you know so that's how very humble you are about who you are and what you've done but um and then i was horrified when i realized who you were as far as how stupid that had been and ignorant but i was kind of glad it was that way but i I remember thinking that you had, you, you had both fallen in love with this place, as in it had really, yeah. it just, it had grabbed you for all the same reasons. Am yeah. I right? It, it, uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, because we came here, you come here for, from someplace like Los Angeles, where you are basically, uh, 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 most people are pissants. And, and, you know, you're just kind of there at people's pleasure. Just sausage yeah, machine. Yeah, just skins. turn it out. And uh, when we came here, we realized you could actually make a difference in your community. Mm. LA is the consummate, unfriendly city, as far as I'm concerned. It's only what 
What can you do for me? Who are you? Is there something you can do for me to get on? And should I know you? Because can you help me? Yeah, and, it, and if you can't, I don't want to know you. Move aside. Yes. I always remember the first time I spotted somebody looking over my shoulder at a party to see if somebody more interesting had walked through the door. And I mean, I'm shit you not. This is, this really is, if, you know, this is exactly how it is. You're sort of saying hello to somebody and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it really, it's just like, it's, it's a, uh, it's shocking, but that's really, really how it is. Yeah. That's how it is. Yeah, we, we found that to be true. You'd, you'd invite a bunch of people over for dinner, and then you'd get cancellations because they found, they found a better something. thing to do. Better invitation. Yes. Better invitation. Yes. So much, we were, much better. It turns out we were very happy to move here. And then uh, I did something here that I swore I wouldn't do, which is, <laughs> which is have a studio. So because I had a, 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 what was a, a famous studio in Los Angeles called Crystal Sound. Oh yeah, tell us about that. Well, Crystal was uh, uh, my partner, Andrew Berliner, and uh, he was a mad genius. He built a studio, it was in, uh, in uh, an, it was originally a post office, then it was a Burns and Sawyer rental for film place, uh, but it was perfect for a studio because it had gigantic ceilings, huge, big open room. Uh, anyway, studio was built and uh, Andrew did all the early Jackson 5 stuff from the time Michael had to get on a Coca-Cola little thing they put the Cokes in. Oh, a, little a Coke crate case. to stand yeah. up. Yeah. To stand on because you were so little. Yeah, and we landed up doing Motown stuff every day. Anyway, I got interested in, in studios and I liked that. I tried to be a musician. That was just disastrous. That was horrible because I was horrible. Uh, but I, I loved the music and I wanted to be involved. I was about to do a Carole King album, the first one called Writer, Carole King. And so I checked the studio out and we did the writer there. And then I just never left. I just stayed there. And so we did a lot of Motown stuff. We did Motown strings almost every morning during the week, 9, 9 a.m. Uh, How many sessions a day would you do in that, at that time? Well, in those days, basically, you had um, union sessions. Yeah. They were three hours to the dot. Yeah. And the studio was on Vine Street, but also the musicians' union was uh, like two blocks away. <laughs> yeah. So you had to actually get by the book, yeah. really. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we had, it was a time where there were uh, starting to be a lot of independent studios because younger musicians didn't want to go to Capitol. They didn't want to go to Columbia. They didn't want to work with the older engineers. Uh, they wanted to work with people their age. Yeah. And so we started getting a lot of that. Uh, Jackson Brown, James Taylor, Carole King. I mean, if you look for Crystal Sound and look for a discography, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it was that time there weren't there weren't a lot of us doing it, yeah. so it was different. And also, because we were young, we wanted to have uh, the best of everything. So anyway, uh, I, uh, I landed up with Stevie. I landed up with Stevie. How did that kind come of, about? Well, it came, Was that about, crystal? it came about overnight, and it, it had to do with his two engineers, Bob Margaleff and Malcolm Cecil. Now, I knew from Denver, friends of mine had a group called Lothar and the Hand People, and they landed up in New York and they were produced and engineered by Bob Margaleff. So I knew Bob. Uh, for some reason, I was hanging out with them. They were, had started doing Stevie and uh, so I met Stevie and we kind of got friendly and they were working at Electric Lady in New, in New York. Mm -hmm. And one day I got a call from Bob saying, we're all moving to LA. And we're in the middle of doing an album. Can we use Come to Crystal? 
okay, come to Crystal. So they did, and they worked at Crystal for a while, and then another studio called them and said, we'll build you your own room. And off they went. So they went to Record Plant. Record Plant built them their own room, and they made some phenomenal albums. They were great engineers. They were really, I loved both of them. Uh, one day, though, uh, in 1974, I got a call from Stevie, and he said, do you have time tonight there? I said, well, I'll check, and I checked with the woman who booked the place. She said, believe it or not, we actually do, which was rare. And uh, I said, yeah, we have time. We're coming over with Bob and Malcolm. I figured maybe their studio was down or yeah. something. He said, uh, no, he said, can you do the sessions? Okay, uh, so he came, and that was that. That was two and a half years. <laughs> on the Songs of Songs in the Cave, yeah, at, at Crystal. At Crystal, yeah. We worked a couple of other places, but uh, the most that we ever used out of that was maybe a basic track. But the rest was all done at the studio at Crystal. Well, you were yeah. on the ride then, and that was it. Yeah, and he, uh, he brought with him Gary Elazbal, who is now Gary Adante, yeah. uh, who was Bob and Malcolm's assistant. Oh. And, and Gary became my partner. And we just, you needed two people. <laughs> Out of Songs in the Key of Life, we recorded more than 200 songs. Oh, my good grief. So... Uh, and out of that came however many are on Songs and Key of Life. And plus we had extras, which is why there was an, an EP, a little 45. But uh, that's not typical, play. John. I mean, that's when you, no. I remember the first time you told me this, I was flabbergasted because A, Songs in the Key of Life is one of those most special creations. I mean, there are, there are things that you know that, that really are special and, and stand the test of time, but also they're masterpieces. And I think that is a masterpiece. I think most people would, would, would agree with that. And, and certainly to me, as a, you know, listening to that as a kid, it, it, it was a lifesaver. And I say this over and over, I've said it many, many times, but it was, I, it was a thing of such eloquence and beauty and magnificence. I, I, I was just in, deeply in shock, but so deeply moved by it. And then when you told me that there were like 200 songs yeah. that were not, heard, um, it, it beggars belief. I mean, that's really unusual, which, of which, where are they? I would, I would uh, ask the they next sit, question. They sit in a, 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 a vault that is really meant for movie stock. So yeah. people, because it's freezing in there with very controlled temperature and humidity, yeah. and uh, they sit in there. And, uh, you know, someday I hope people hear parts of those. I hope so, too. Yeah. I, I mean, mean you, you described to me hearing him walking in and just sitting at the piano, and what was the one song you said that he just sat down and played solo, and that was... Oh, uh, Love's in Need of Love Today. That, that yeah. Well, we, we always had a, a two-track yeah. tape machine ready to go because sometimes out of the cosmos, mm -hmm. he would go to the piano, and we always had a mic there, and he would start a song, and the song would have a melody, and a lot of times then he would sing a scratch vocal mm -hmm. that had, uh, it had the rhythm mm -hmm. of the words, mm -hmm. but no real words. Yeah. But yeah. sometimes it had a key phrase mm -hmm. in there, and then, We'd have that, and then yeah. later he'd write the song, and sometimes the songs would come down uh, uh, like rain. Yeah. The parts would literally come from somewhere, and they'd float down, and he would start recording something, and uh, <laughs> sometimes we'd say, are you sure that part is right? Because he's doing like a fifth part first. Mm. You know, so it doesn't really make sense until he does the So other. the harmony-wise, he'd start with the most, the least... Yeah, yeah, it didn't matter to him. 
he knew what they were going to be. One. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the same it's with genius. There's no doubt. When he double, he double a vocal sometimes, except it was so right on that it sounded like a single vocal. Yep. So. Yeah. He's an astounding, astounding talent, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of fun doing it. I think when it finally came out, we were shocked that there were like lines around Tower Record to get the record, and I remember driving the day it came out. It didn't matter what button you pushed on your radio. That's all you heard. It was all you heard. My mother uh, called me. She had. Uh, was in Morocco and she said oh I just heard it in the souks so wow. yeah it, it was everywhere for a while oh, it, listen, was really... it was my Christmas present and I remember hearing when I wish was released in Britain it went I mean it was otherworldly it was indescribably joyous and I've ne I'd never heard anything like it it was it's just sublime yeah, I wish was the last song was re it? recorded for the uh, because that's what he was waiting for. He was waiting for that stuff to come down and give him a hit single. Yeah. And he, you know, that's why the two hundred songs, you know, they they just kept coming, and uh, some would get finished, some wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But boy. When that came, yeah. Yeah, he said, that's it. And we did all over. And you could and finish everything. then once that had come. That's incredible. Yeah, because, you know, Crystal was, the control room was huge and the console was huge and in, it was up on a platform and in front of it was a, a couch. You know, people would sit there and after a while, we had Motown people every day, every day sitting on the couch because they wanted, well, it was coming up to Grammy time. Mm -hmm. You had to get the submission in by a certain date. And so Gary and I got T-shirts made that said, we're almost finished. <laughs> oh, my God. The horn sounds on some of the songs that have been, especially the horn track has been sampled a lot, mm -hmm. uh, was horns facing out into a room, but we were miking a uh, plaster wall behind them, as well as the front. That's how you get got this weird resonant sound. So with Sir Duke, yeah. for example, yeah. that sound, which is so different in the horns, it's, it almost sounds like a, a retro, th it's amazing. If you listen to, I think, Village Ghetto Land, mm -hmm. if you listen on headphones, You'll hear, you know. You can hear him swaying when yeah, he moves he, his head? Yeah. Wow. He's an anomaly, though. I mean, well, I have to say, he really is. Just startling. His, uh, I'm not going to call it studio discipline, it's his own discipline about how to work a microphone. Mm -hmm. Is just, the whole thing is astounding. He was just astounding. I mean, everything, everything. I yeah. mean, Here's a guy that doesn't use his thumbs when he plays. Yeah, I noticed that. It's remarkable. <laughs> yeah, and I'm trying to think if I ever heard him sing a bad note. I was going to say, have you ever heard him sing a bad note? No, not really. Not really. There was never a time we wished for auto-tune, <laughs> which, which didn't exist. It was the same with harmonica. Oh, he, yes. he He played chromatic harmonica, you know, the one with the little yeah. thing that you push? Yeah. So you can get sharps and stuff. Yeah. He never ever touched that unless he was going to use it. He was like a gunfighter, you know. Don't pull that gun until you. <laughs> until you absolutely do it. need to. Have you ever seen those little harmonicas? They're the about this big. Ones, yeah, yeah. And people are wearing yeah, them. Yeah, he was chain. given one as a present. Yeah, you could play how, that. Don't tell me. Yeah, no, that's how he started. That started it. Oh, oh my God, he'd tell people he could really see. <laughs> you know. And he'd say, put some fingers up, I'll tell you. And, you know, and then you'd tap him under the console. So many. Yeah. yeah. And he could also take a roll of tape and heave it across the, the control room and hit you. <gasps> also, if you ever played air hockey with him, he'd cream you. No! Oh, yeah. 
How? He, he was How is merciless. This even... He was merciless. He was... I, I have no idea. I don't even know how that's possible. No, he just, that's him. I know, I know. It's like they're doing roadworks everywhere in the city. No, I feel you, I feel you. I'd, I'd have a hatchet if I was here all day. These guys aren't bad at all. I don't know, I'm feeling, I have more empathy for them. I don't know what happened. I just feel, Anyway, thank you for spending a little bit of your Halloween Sunday with me, Judith Owen, your hostess with the mostest newfound love of clownery. Don't know what's come over me. Anyway, I will see you next Sunday for yet another edition of For Feck's Sake. Thank you so much to John Fishback. There will be many more conversations with him coming up, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I decided what's the right song for this occasion, well, you know what it had to be. It's a throwback to something I did on FFS months and months and months ago. It features David Blankhorn, Pedro Segundo, and myself in a creepy little video. Thank you, Ken Webb, for that. Here is, I put a spell on you. I'm putting a spell on you, people. I'll see you next Sunday. Until then, stay safe. Love you all. No, I know. I know. Put a spell on you, baby, because you're mine. You better stop the things that you do. I ain't lying. No, no, I ain't lying. I just can't stand it, baby. Stand the way you're always running round And I can't stand the way you always put me down I put a spell on you Oh, no, no Because you're mine
Cause you're mine All mine You better stop the things that you do I ain't lying I ain't lying I can't stand it, baby Put me down I put a spell on you Because you're mine I put a spell on you Make your mind mine, mine, mine I put a spell on you Cause you're mine Well, that was fascinating, wasn't it? Me hanging out with clowns in the French Quarter, what can I say? Welcome to a very special Halloween edition of FFX. S, you know, because... That's surprising. <laughs>